the arc of my book braids together two narratives. First, the long course of the war, and second, the experience of individuals. It's crucial to note that those two actually don't match up very well. For nearly all Patriot soldiers, the span from the beginning to the end of the war isn't the same as the time running from their enlistment to, to their discharge. When we consider the war's events in the context of young soldiers' expectations, their actions, their words, their memories, this breaks up the traditional narrative of the revolution. So rather than a story that starts with Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, uh, progresses to a middle point of virtuous suffering at Valley Forge, and then ends triumphantly with Yorktown, the decisions and experiences of these individual soldiers and officers drives my narrative. Because youths can enlist for a few months, for a campaign, for a series of years. And many who served cobbled together multiple engagements, joining, hopefully leaving, military service in trajectories that have little relationship to the arc of a war that's visible only in hindsight. So, rather than move chronologically across the war, I examine phases of experience. First, joining the army. Here I consider the ambitions of young men, junior officers, enlisted soldiers, as they join for self-advancement, for status, money, land, or to escape rough homes. I found an inordinate number of evil stepmother stories in the archives. There's one that's so good, there's basically a runaway apprentice who makes up a story that he's running away from an evil stepmother, so no one realizes that he's a runaway apprentice. It's excellent. The dark side of this is that there's also a lot of coercion, hard coercion, soft coercion, that pushes young men towards war. So a key part of this chapter explores the choices that some youths, some young men, make to avoid continental service. Our hardy youth rise up to manhood faster than war itself can kill them. So a Patriot newspaper blithely proclaimed early in 1776. The reality of mobilization is not so simple. When I was looking at young men, I realized there's an explanation for why the Continental Army is never strong enough to win and end the war alone, outright. In part, it's because of the expectations of the young men it tried to recruit. Those young men had too many other military options that could fulfill their ambitions or satisfy their local communities. Militia service, state troops, privateering, these all are competing with Congress's army. Short enlistments look better than long. And as a result, the Continental Army never came close to meeting its recruitment goals. Traditionally, historians have focused this question on uh, trying to answer whether mobilization is impressively effective, considering all things, or whether it's actually disappointingly ineffectual. By one count, mobilization in the American Revolution is amazing. Um, basically, every patriot male of military age bears arm at some point. That is incredible. And considering the weakness of the um, coercive mechanisms of the 18th century, it's really impressive. But Washington never had enough Continentals to win the war alone. They planned for 88 battalions in 1777. Those 88 battalions could have won the war. They could have recaptured New York, driven Howe out of Philadelphia, turned, smashed Burgoyne, doesn't happen because those 88 battalions never come into being, not in the size that they were supposed to. But blame for this shortfall does not lie with the young men of the revolutionary generation. They met the obligations imposed by their communities. 